Good day everyone. So today we are going to tackle the last topic of our syllabus in this subject which is all about legends, folk tales and local color. In this topic we have seven subtopics. We have first the fables, next is tall tales, legends related to natural phenomena, religious folk tales, horror stories, modern cultural references of myths and folk tales, and the last is the local folk literature. So let's start. Since we already tackled on our previous discussion about legends and folk tales, we all have a knowledge on it, but I just wanted to give you additional information to inculcate it to your mind. Legends came from the Latin word legenda, meaning things to be read. Legends are believable, although not necessarily believe. A legend usually includes an element of truth or is based on historic facts but with mythical qualities. Legends usually involve heroic characters or fantastic places and often encompass the spiritual beliefs of the culture in which they originate. On the other hand, folktale is usually passed down through oral retelling. A folktale is a popular story that was passed on in spoken form from one generation to the next. Usually the author is unknown and there are often many versions of the tale. Folk tales comprise fables, fairy tales, old legends, and even urban legends. So what do we mean by local color? It is not a color like blue or green. It is defined as the characteristics and traits that make a location unique. Local color captures the effect the special atmosphere of the area and its people often contains regional dialects, well-known places, customs, etc. of a particular area. Because of lack of communication and transportation, it shows how people live in other parts of the country. The first subtopic, we have fables. The word fable comes from the Latin word fabula or meaning story. Fables are stories intended to teach a lesson and animals often speak and act like human beings. It is featuring animals that behave and speak as a human beings told in order to highlight human follies and weaknesses. So let's have here elements to remember. Animals are usually the main characters. The plot and characters are simple. Stories teach a moral or a lesson. Setting is common and non-specific. Authors uses personification. So, what do we mean by the word personification? In simple terms, it's making animals or objects seem like real people with real human feelings and emotions. Personification comes from the root word person. Aesop was a slave that lived about 550 BC. He is famous for his fables. Legend says he was granted freedom from his master because he enjoyed the story so much. Interesting, Aesop didn't write down any of his fables. But after his death, they were written down for him. The examples of life lessons from Aesop's fables are the grasshopper and the ants, the tortoise and the hare, the lion and the mouse. The purpose of the author is that these stories were brief and told to adults for entertainment. These stories were passed down from generation to generation. Here are many examples of fable. The frog and the ox. A young frog amazed at the huge size of an ox rushed to tell her father about the monster. The father frog, trying to impress his child, puffed himself up to look like the ox. The young frog said it was much bigger. Again, the father puffed himself up. The young frog insisted the monster was even bigger. The father puffed and puffed 
and burst. The moral lesson that we can get from this story is that be true to your own character. Meaning to say, you need to be contented on what you are. You are being true to yourself if you are completely honest with what you feel, deeply value and desire. It also means communicating your feeling wholeheartedly with yourself and others, allowing your truth to flow through you and to do all into the world. So next, we move to tall tales. What is all about tall tales? A tall tale is a fictional story that stretches the truth. The heroes or sheroes of tall tales are larger than life. Sometimes, heroes or sheroes in a tall tale are completely made up. Sometimes, they are based on an actual person who really lived. Tall tales were first told in America by the settlers who made their homes in the American wilderness. In those days, people didn't have TV, movies, or even many books. So they depended on storytelling for their entertainment. After a long day's work, people would gather together and tell one another unbelievable stories. Through the telling of this story, these characters are given exaggerated characteristics. They are bigger or stronger than the real people and solve problems in a way that is hard to believe. So here are the four things that all tall tales have in common. First is, the main character has a regular job but is larger than life or superman in his or her abilities. Second is that, the character has a problem or problems that he or she solves in a funny way. Third is, the tales in the story are exaggerated beyond belief. And the last is that, the characters use everyday language and are like common people in behavior. Some classic tall tales, heroes and sheroes are Paul Bunyan, Johnny Appleseed, David Crockett, John Henry, Pecos Bill, and Slewfoot Sue. So we have here some of the classic heroes and tall tales. We have Pecos Bill, an American cowboy used a rattlesnake as a lasso could ride anything including a tornado, rode a horse named Widowmaker, and had a love interest named Slewfutsu. Another hero we have Davy Crockett. Based on the real life American hero, Crockett had many historical exploits but also had many tall tales about him. Wore his coonskin cup, killed a bear when he only 3 years old could catch a bullet in his teeth. Crockett died at the Alamo in 1836. And the last one is the most common heroes in the tall tale is Paul Bunyan. Have you ever heard the story of Paul Bunyan? The tale of Paul Bunyan is all about 150 years old. It was first told at logging camps in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. A logging camp is a place where people chop down trees for wood. At night, the lumberjacks sat around campfires. They told the story of Paul Bunyan. According to the tale, Paul Bunyan was born in Maine. He weighed 80 pounds when he was born. As Paul grew, his mother had to make him extra large clothes. She used wagon wheels for buttons. Paul was too huge for a regular baby carriage. Instead, his parents put him in a wagon pulled by oxen. At meal time, Paul would devour 40 bowls of porridge and cry for more. When Paul turned one, he got a special pet. It was a huge blue ox that Paul named Babe. Paul and Babe loved playing together, but every time they played, they left their mark. Their giant footprints filled with rainwater and turned into lakes. When Paul grew up, he became a lumberjack. He and Babe traveled west to chop down trees. A theme of strongman work for Paul. 
They look up to him because he could solve any problem. Once, Paul put out forest fire by asking Babe to drink all the water from a river. Then he tickled Babe's stomach until the ox spit the water on the flames. Hiring lumberjacks to help him was one of the best decisions Paul ever made. But it was a good thing he was a problem solver because clever th thinking was needed to feed and house thousands of men. Paul built a chow table so long that it took a week for a dish to get from one end to other. He made a frying pan the size of an ice skating rink. 100 men would strap bacon onto their skates to grease it. And with all those thirsty men around, Paul had to dig out five big holes to fill with water so everyone would have enough to drink. Those water holes are known as the Great Lakes today. Years later, Paul and Babe made their way to Oregon where they settled down to retire. If old Paul were still around today, he'd most likely be using his problem-solving skills to grow and increase the forest. With Babe's help, of course, for sure he'd have some mighty good ideas about how to do that. Another subtopic we have legends related to natural phenomena. Legends resemble factors in content. They may include supernatural beings, elements of mythology, or explanation of natural phenomena, but they are associated with a particular locality or person and are told as a matter of history. Scientists says that if you dig deep enough, you can find some truth to legends and creation stories. Legends have fed the imaginations and souls of humans for thousands of years. The vast majority of these tales are just stories people have handed down through the ages. But a few have roots in real geological events of the past, providing warning of potential dangers and speaking to the awe we hold for the might of the planet. So, here are some of the examples of legends that related to natural phenomena. Pelian Eruption Pele came to Hawaii with her sisters and other relatives. She started in Kauai. There, she met the man Lohiau, but she did not stay because there was no land hot enough for her liking. She eventually settled in the crater at Kilauea on the big island of Hawaii and asked her sister Hiyaka to return for Lohia. In return, Hiyaka asked that Pele did not destroy her beloved forest. Hiyaka was given 40 days for the task but did not return in time. Pele thinking that Hiyaka and Lohia had become romantically entangled and because of that, she set the forest on fire. After Hiyaka discovered what had happened, she made love to Lohiau in view of Pele. So Pele killed Lohiau and drew his body into the her crater. Hiyaka dug furiously to recover the body, rocks flying as she dug deeper. She finally recovered his body and they are now together. Science says that it seems like a celestial soap opera actually describes volcanic activity at Kilauea. The burning forest was probably a lava flow, the largest island experience since its settlement by Polynesians. Lava flowed continuously for 60 years in the 15th century, covering some 430 square kilometers of the islands of Hawaii. Hiyaka's furious digging may represent the formation of the volcano's modern caldera that occurred in these years after the lava flow. Another, we have the exploding lake. The Kom people in Cameroon live for a short time in the land of the Bamisi. The leader or fawn of the Kom discovered a plot by the Bamisi fawn to kill all the young men in his kingdom. And the calm fawn vowed revenge. He told to his sister he would hang himself 
and the fluids from his body would form a lake. The com were not to go near the lake. They were to leave the fish for the mummy sea and should prepare themselves to leave the region on the day that was set for catching fish. On that day, when the mummy sea entered the lake to fish, the lake exploded and drowning everyone. Scientifically basis, on the night of August 21, 1986, Lake Nias, volcanic lake in Cameroon, released a deadly cloud of carbon dioxide killing 1,700 people sleeping in nearby villages. A smaller degusting event at the Lake Monaon two years earlier killed 37. Carbon dioxide can build up waters at the bottom of volcanic lakes such as this, where it is kept dissolved by the pressure of the lake water above. Such events might have been behind the exploding lake of the Com legend. Next, we have the Vanish Islands. People on the Solomon Islands of the South Pacific tell the stories of Teonin Manu, the island that disappeared. Reponit had taken a woman from the island to be his wife, but her brother took her back. So Reponit turned to sorcery and revenge. He was given three taro plants, two to plant on Teoni Manu, and one to keep. When new leaves sprouted on his plants, it was a sign that the island was about to sink. People had noticed to flee the islands, although it became salty as the ocean water rose. They fled in boats, rafts, or clinging to trees that will wash off the land. Science says large shoal sits at the eastern edge of the Solomon Islands, part of a ridge that flanks the 5,000-meter deep Cape Johnson Trench. According to Nunn, an earthquake could have sparked a landslide that let the island slide into the trench. Underwater maps have revealed several islands submerged under hundreds of meters of water. Islands have probably been sinking in this region for a million of years. Next legend that related to natural phenomena is Atlantis. Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher, wrote of a great civilization called Atlantis, founded by a race of people who were half god and half human. They lived in Utopia that held great naval power, but their home located on islands shaped like a series of concentric circles was destroyed in a great cataclysm. According to science, Atlantis probably wasn't a real place, but a real island civilization may have inspired the tale. Among the contenders in Santorini in Greece, Santorini is now an archipelago but thousands of years ago, it was a single island, a volcano named Terra. Around 3,500 years ago, the volcano blew up in one of the biggest eruptions in the human history, destroying the island, setting off tsunamis and blowing tones of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere where it lingered for years and probably caused many cold and wet. The city of Helike in Greece has also been suggested as inspiration for Atlantis. The ancient metropolis was wiped off the map by an earthquake and tsunami in December of the year 373 BC. Next. We have the legend of Namazu, the Earthshaker. Buried beneath the pine is a giant catfish named Namazu. The god Kashima keeps Namazu still with the help of a giant stone placed on the fish head. But when Kashima sleeps, Namazu can move its feelers or its tail, causing the ground above to move. Scientifically explanation, Japan, which sits at the junction of several tectonic plates, is home to volcanoes and is crisscrossed by seismic faults making it the number one country for earthquakes. No giant catfish necessary. Catfish also figure in the Japanese myth in another way. 
the fish are supposedly able to predict an earthquake. Decades of research has failed to find any link between catfish behavior and earthquakes. However, and the country now relies on the sophisticated early warning system that detects seismic waves and sends messages to people so they can take actions such as slowing trains before the worst of the shaking arrives. To conclude, there is no way of telling which came first, the disaster or the story. But legends can provide clues to the past and even help fill in gaps in scientific knowledge about long ago geological phenomena. And now, we will move forward to the next subtopic which is all about religious folk tales. Religious tales are usually didactic but can be humorous. It refers to system of concepts that are of high importance to asserting community, making a statement concerning the supernatural or sacred. The themes of religious tales are the topics of catechisms and theological treatises, faith, miracles, repentance, conversion, forgiveness, and redemption. Examples are Sikh stories, Hindu stories, Islamic stories, and many more. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, there is the fairly well-known creation story in the book of Genesis, the book where Adam and Eve appear in the Garden of Eden. According to this story, God created the heavens and the earth and man in perfect paradise. Well, sin emerges and God extends his further judgment and punishment. The Christian story unfolds and many stories later, Jesus of Nazareth appears, come to reconcile man with God and offer himself for the sin of humanity. And the purpose of religious narrative is to express the thought and maintain that kind of connection with the transcendent through storytelling. In certain branches of Hinduism, there is the creation story that links divine Vishnu, the incomprehensible transcendent being, with creation. His sport and folly and love entailed manifesting itself in the form of various avatars, Lord Krishna, for example, and dispersing himself throughout the universe. He is all pervasive, all encompassing. Creation represents his divine will and expansion, the divine expansion of his will. Not all religious tales have happy ending. The singing bone represents a large group of tales in which a guiltless hero was killed. Many years later, the murderer is brought to justice through the miraculous singing of a horn mouthpiece made from one of the dead man's bones. So, I have here some of the examples of the ancient religious tales of Virgin Hokansif. The first one we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. Both Christians and Muslims believe that Jesus was conceived in the womb of his mother Mary through the power of the Holy Spirit. His mother Mary was still a virgin by then. She had not had any sexual relations with Joseph to whom she was engaged to. In this tale, an angel called Gabriel appeared to Mary and informed her that she would be expectant. Mary was greatly troubled and she wondered how that could be, yet she was still a virgin. She was told by the angel that she would conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit. The baby would then grow up to be the Messiah. Today, Jesus is an epic figure in Christianity which is the largest religious denomination in the world. Next, we have Empress, the mother of Laozi. According to legend, Laozi was born to a virgin mother whose name was Empress. She is said to have conceived him through the power of a polar star which had holy rays. The virgin mother carried him for 62 years in her womb. Then she gave birth to him out of her left armpit while leaning against a palm tree. 
The baby was born with white hair and a long white beard. Hence, his name was Lauzi, which meant old master. The mother died after giving birth, but it is believed that her soul emerged with that of her son and became one. Another is the story of Nana, the mother of Atis. The myth about Nana's conception is a big milestone in the religion of ancient Greece. According to this myth, Nana was the daughter of the river Sangarius. Zeus, the king of the gods, fell asleep and by mistake he let his seed fall upon the ground. The seed, in the course of time, sent up a demon with two sexual organs, male and female. The demon was called Kybil. The gods, fearing the demon, cut off the male organ. From the male organ, there grew up an almond tree which had ripe fruits. Nana, who was by then still a virgin, picked one of the fruits and laid it into her bosom. The tree immediately disappeared, but Nana had already conceived. A boy was born and he was named Atis. And the last we have Maya, the mother of Buddha. Maya was a queen married to King Sudhodana of the ancient Kapilavastu kingdom. Though married, she had taken a vow of self-denial, hence she remained a virgin. According to legend, one full moon light, when she was sleeping in the palace, she had a vivid dream. She left herself being carried away by four spirits to Lake Anota in the Himalayas. The spirits bathed her in the lake anointed her with perfumes and bedeck her with divine flowers. Then, a white elephant holding a white lotus flower in its trunk appeared. It went round her three times, entering her womb through her right side. Finally, the elephant disappeared and the queen awoke. This unnatural conception is the foundation of Buddhism. The Buddha was born on 8th of April and was given the name Siddhartha. Therefore, such tales admit the world was flowed. Undeserved pain, suffering, and death do occur and the victim loss may be irreversible. In this world, the best we can hope for is the punishment of perpetrator. Religious folk tales often feature biblical characters in apocryphal or even um, unbiblical roles. Now, let's move to another subtopic which is all about horror stories. <laughs> People read horror stories because they enjoy the thrill of being scared. Horror story is a story in which the focus is on creating a feeling of fear. Such tales are of ancient origin and form a substantial part of the body of folk literature. They can feature supernatural elements such as ghosts, witches, or vampires, or they can address more realistic psychological fears. Horror is a genre of literature, film, and television that is meant to scare startle, shock, and even repulse audiences. The key focus of a horror novel, horror film, or horror TV show is to elicit a sense of dread in the reader through frightening images, themes, and situations. In the horror genre, story and characters are just as important as mood and atmosphere. A horror story often shocks and provokes with its exploration of the unknown. So we have here the history of the horror genre, roots in folklore and religious traditions, themes such as death, evil, demonic beings, witches, vampires, werewolves, mummies, and ghosts. In Western literature, the literary cultivation of fear and curiosity for its own sake began to emerge in the 18th century pre-romantic era with the Gothic novel. The genre was invented by Horace Walpole, whose Castle of Otronto 
1764, may be the said to have founded the horror story as the legitimate literary form. Next is Vatek, 1786 by William Beckford, The Mysteries of Odolfo, 1794. Much of the horror of this era was written by women and marketed for a female. Horror in the 19th century In the Romantic era, the German storyteller E.T.A. Hoffman and American Edgar Allan Poe raised the horror story level far above mere entertainment through their skillful intermingling for reason and madness eerie atmosphere and everyday reality they invested their spectres doubles and haunted houses with a psychological symbolism that give their tales haunting credibility example of this are frankenstein 1818 by mary shelley varied works of edgar Allan poe including the fall of house of usher telltale heart Cask of Amontillado, The Raven, Mosque of the Red Death, Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, 1886 by Robert Louis Stevenson, The Picture of Dorian Gray, 1890 by Oscar Wilde, and Dracula by Bram Stoker. The modern horror in the 20th century drew on themes of the past and new themes including apocalyptic, zombie, fiction, and increased level of supernatural beings. Examples are Cool Air, 1925, The Vault, 1926, and The Outsider, 1926, were written by H.P. Lovecraft. I Am Legend, 1954, was written by Richard Matheson, Varied works of Stephen King are best known contemporary horror example as Curry. So we have here six subgenres of horror stories. First is Gothic. It is focused specifically on death. Next, Paranormal. It is involving ghost stories or supernatural horror events that do not exist within this context of scientific explanation. Next, we have Occult. It is a horror story about ritual practices that are not considered religion or science. Dark Fantasy Horror Stories that blend dark elements of fantasy. Next is Survival. It is a horror story in which the main character is being hunted and trying to survive within their circumstances. And the last we have science fiction horror. It is a horror story that blend elements of science and fiction. Usually in horror stories, the settings are in the dark, old haunted house, deserted buildings, isolated house, graveyard, medieval world, dark forest, old castles, psychiatric ward, orphanage, nighttime, morgue, and many more. Usually the themes for the horror stories is all about revenge, haunting, demons and exorcism, gore, serial killers, monsters, and satanic possessors. The usually characters are of victims in the horror genre is women, children, helpless, and innocent one, while the characters of the killers are masked man, possessed demons, psycho killer, and many more. Example Frankenstein's by Mary Shelley, 1823. A horror story about a scientist who accidentally creates a monster when his experiment goes horribly wrong. Next, we have a strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, 1886. A horror story about a man who drinks a serum and transforms into his sinister, alter ego, a wild, unpredictable killer. Next, we have Dracula by Bram Stoker, 1897. 
a gothic horror about a vampire who wants to spread the undead curse to as many people as possible. Next, we have The Rats in the Walls by H.P. Lovecraft, 1924. A classic example of Lovecraftian horror, a horror genre that emphasizes man versus nature, short story about human cannibalism. Psycho by Robert Bloch, 1959. A horror story about the queer taker of a motel in the middle of nowhere, who commits a series of gruesome murders. Next is The Exorcist by William Peter Blighty, 1971. A horror story about a young girl who gets possessed by an evil demon. And the last example is It by Stephen King, 1986. A horror story about a group of kids who terrorized by an evil being that haunts them by transforming into what scares them. So now, let's move to the next subtopic which is Modern Cultural References of Myths and Folktales. Myths and Folktales have survived to this day due to the fact that their narratives are still valid in contemporary context and corresponds to situations that occur in our own day and age. Above all, the power of the myths lies in their symbolism, which not only help shape the origins of modern storytelling, but also influence the most unsetting stories of our modern popular culture. The Greeks made important contributions to philosophy, mathematics, astronomy, and medicine. Literature and theater was an important aspect of Greek culture and influenced modern drama. The Greeks were known for their sophisticated sculpture and architecture. Greek culture influenced the Roman Empire and many civilizations and it continues to influence modern cultures today. It is more than 2,000 years since the time of the ancient Greeks. But Greek mythology continues to have an influence on how we live today in Western society. Everywhere you turn, there is likely to be a reference to Greek mythology. The Greeks were pioneers with their contributions to math and science. Fundamental ideas about geometry and the concept of Mathematical proof come from ancient Greek mathematicians like Pythagoras, Euclid, and Archimedes, whose breakthroughs are used even today. Some of the earliest astronomical knowledge came from Greek society and mythology. Models developed by ancient Greeks describe the planetary movements and give us an insight into the solar system. The solar system is said to be heliocentric with the sun in the center around which the planets revolve and the word heliocentric signifies that the planet turn around Helios, the Greek sun god. The planets too have been named after Roman version of Greek gods like Mars god of war and others. Constellations and zodiac signs have been named after figures present in myth perpetuated by the Greeks, with Scorpius, Orion, Leo, and Capricorn being prominent examples. For example, the zodiac sign of Aries, the ram. Zeus placed a golden ram's image among the stars in honor of its heroism. Cancer, the crab was a creature sent by the goddess Hera to destroy Heracles. Pieces, the fish, named after Aphrodite and Eros, who were turned into fish by Zeus to help them escape in danger. Next is mythology in medicines. The symbol of the field of medicine is a stuff intertwined by a snake, the symbol of the god of medicine, Asclepius. For thousands of years, the characters, stories, and themes of Greek mythology has shaped art and modern culture. They appear in numerous Renaissance paintings such as 
Botticelli's Birth of Venus and Raphael's Triumph of Galatea and writings like Dante's Inferno. Greek myths have also been adapted into modern novels, movies, TV shows, video games, and brands in more recent times. References to Greek mythology can be seen in popular books and movies for children like Harry Potter. The first Western theater originated in Athens and was, like many other ancient Greek theaters, a semicircular structure cut into a hillside that was capable of seating 10,000 to 20,000 people. Many other brands and businesses depict the extents of the influence of Greek mythology in modern world. First, we have Hermes. He was the messenger of Greek gods, but today, you will see this name for the company that specializes in luxury goods, lifestyle, accessories, and perfumes. So there is Dove. The Dove was a symbol of Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty. Unilever owns the personal care brand by the same name. Cereal, the generic name of our breakfast meal, is named after Ceres, the goddess of grain. Next, we have Amazon. One of the biggest known brands derives its name from the Amazons, a race of female warriors in Greek mythology. Pandora, the jewelry brand, took its name from the first mortal woman in Greek mythology. Her name meant all gifted. Next is the most famous Starbucks. An allusion to Greek mythology in our modern world can be found in the Starbucks logo. The half-human, half-siren figure found in the cup is referred to sirens that attack many mariners with the intention of killing them by crushing their ships. Nike in mythology, which Greek goddess of victory in battle or peaceful competition. Nike in modern world, Nike designs develops markets and sells athletic footwear, apparel, equipment, and accessories. Olympus in mythology, highest mountain in Greece, home of the gods and goddesses, formed after the titans were defeated. Olympus today is passionate about creating customer drive solutions for the medical, life sciences, and industrial equipment industries. The modern Olympics is one of the biggest contributions by Greek mythology. The ancient Olympics originally began in the year 776 BC and were primarily held in the honor of Zeus, the father and king of Greek gods and goddesses. The prizes for winning were fame and glory. The statues of the winners were built and sometimes the winners' faces were even put on coins. Today, we still celebrate some of the old traditions such as the olive leaf crown on winner's head, the lighting of the Olympic flame, and the opening and closing celebrations. The columns or pillars you see on grand buildings today are most likely inspired by Greek architecture. The most famous example of Greek architecture is the Parthenon, a magnificent building with pillars located in Athens. It was a temple dedicated to Athena Queen queen of gods from the people of Athens. Today, pillars are used in many public buildings such as churches and libraries. One famous modern-day building is the White House in America where President Donald Trump lives. Santa Claus originated centuries ago as a Dutch folk character. Since the 80s, he has developed into a universally recognized symbol of Christmas who is said to bring gifts to good children. Appreciating our historical origin, specifically the folklore of our ancestors, helps us develop an understanding of their culture from where we originated. One importance of the study of folklores is nationalism, which focuses on the ethnic identity. Secondly, folk culture helps different people living in the same country to be united. Every nation consists of the different ethnic groups which their own distinct tradition and culture. However, despite the difference in traditions, 
being belonging to different ethnic background understand each other because they approach a given situation in the same emotional pattern. Lastly, folk tales is all about human pains which are communicated in the forms of folk customs, folk arts, and so on. Thus, this helps in generating a shared identity. Thus, the study of folk tales or folklore is important in understanding our past so we can function in the present and can be improved in the future. These examples depict just a few ways in which the Greek culture is prevalent even today. The hidden influences of Greek mythology in today's world are vast and these everlasting legends will continue to contribute to the society as well. One just has to look a little closer to unravel the rich history behind the things they see in day-to-day -day life. So the question is, why do we still need to study mythologies and folk tales like in Greek? Reading and hearing about myths and folk tales is one thing, but why are modern people still made to study them? The answer is that very simple, for us to learn. People still study the ancient myths and folk tales much in the same reason they study other cultures and that is so they can learn from it. After all, when you study a culture as progressive as that of the ancient Greeks, you really can't help but to learn that. So finally, we are now at the last subtopic of my report which is all about the local folk literature. As we all know, folk literature includes all the myths, legends, epics, fables, and folk tales passed down by word of mouth through the generations. When we say local folk literature, it is an information that informs people about the local environment. Philippines has a lot of indigenous tribe. Therefore, our country is rich with Filipino folklore stories. There are many Filipino folk tales and famous Philippine legends that have been told throughout the years and have been taught in the Philippine literature. Philippine folk literature refers to the traditional oral literature of the Filipino people. Thus, the scope of the field covers the ancient folk literature of the Philippines, various ethnic groups, as well as various pieces of folklore that have evolved since the Philippines became a single ethnopolitical unit. The oral and thus changeable aspect of folk literature is an important defining characteristic. Much of this oral tradition has been written into a print format. To point out that folklore in a written form can still be considered folklore. Mutely points out that folklore may appear in print but must not freeze into print. So we have here some of the examples of the local folk literature. First is Tuko and the Birds, a tale from the Philippines told by Shirley Climo and illustrated by Francisco X. Mora. Tuko and the Birds, a tale from Philippines, is a story about a tuko arriving in a peaceful small Philippine island of Luzon. The men fish, the women cook, the children played games, and the birds sang. Everyone knew it was time for bed when they heard the birds' goodnight song. Then Tuko arrived. Tuko the gecko bellowed his name five times every time he ate, day or night. Everyone was miserable from lack of sleep. That is, until Haribon the eagle devised a plan to trick Tuko and living for good. Another we have Ang Pambihirang Buhok ni Lola, told by Rene Villanueva and illustrated by Ibarra Crisostomo. Ang Pambihirang Buhok ni Lola is a story about a violent storm that threatens an old town and an old grandmother attempt to save everybody. How will she do this? This folk tales is not so much about Lola's extraordinary hair as it is about the Filipina's extraordinary strength of character. 
we have the famous story about the monkey and the turtle. The monkey and the turtle is a perfect example of folktale short story written by Philippine national hero Jose Rizal. This story focuses on the monkey and turtle who started as friends. They both saw a floating banana plant on the water. They thought of splitting it so they could plant it. The monkey chose the upper part of the plant for he thought it was better. <laughs> Meanwhile, the turtle got the bottom part with the roots so he grew an abundant plant. Since the turtle couldn't climb the tree to get the fruits, he asked the monkey to get it for him. Instead, the monkey betrayed turtle and ate every fruit. The turtle planned a revenge to him which ended to the monkey's death. The friends of the monkey also planned a revenge but they did not win over the turtle. Another example is we have the girl who turned into a fish and other classic Philippine water tales as narrated by Maria Elena Paterno. This Filipino folk tale talks about a beautiful girl who grew up being vain and spoiled. She was admiring her beauty by the river when the chief of crabs adored her beauty and spoke to her. She was shocked and shaved away the crab. In return, the chief scratched her face and cursed her to become a fish with many scales. Next, we have the story of Piña by Neni Santa Romana Cruz depicts the folk tale about Pinang, an adorable yet lazy girl. The time came when her mother asked her to cook, which she ignored at first. When she finally agreed to do it, she could not find the ladle. Her frustrated mother hoped that Pinang could grow hundred eyes for being lazy and so that she could find everything. Later on, Pinang disappeared and then a yellow fruit with hundred eyes grew in their backyard. Next, we have the story of Termite Queen. The mother mountain talks about a widow hill who live with her two daughters that want nothing but to play. The mother asks her daughters to prepare their dinner as soon as she finishes work. By the time the mother came home, the daughters were not there, so she cooked the dinner herself. As soon as the daughters came home, they saw their mother preparing dinner and yet decided to play again. The mother got frustrated and left the house. It was late night and the daughters followed her. Little do they know that their mother turned into a shape of mountain called Mount Erai. Another example is the necklace and the comb. This story tells us of Indai who adored her necklace and comb. She was given this as family heirloom during her 16th birthday. She would keep with her the necklace and comb even while working, so to avoid spoiling them, she put those on the cloud. Her necklace and comb went up later on with the sky. Time came, the comb became the quarter moon and then the necklace turned into the star. Next, we have the carabao and the shell. This carabao and the shell from Mabel Cook Calls Philippine Folk Tales talks about the race that happened between the carabao and the shell. The carabao thought of the shell to be very slow. When the race began, the carabao went for a long distance. He shouted, Shell! And then another shell answered. He went on and on, and every time she shouts to find shell, another shell would answer. Carabao was determined to win the race, so he kept on running until he got exhausted and died. And our last example is all about the man with the coconuts. Another Philippine folk tales from Mabel Cook Cole is the man with the coconut. It narrates the story about a man who gathered his coconuts and loaded it to his horse. He asked a boy by how long it would take for him to go home. 
if you go slowly, you will arrive very soon. But if you go fast, it will take you all day, said the boy and the man found it strange. So he hurried his horse and every time he does this, the coconuts would fall. He was able to reach home when it was already night time. So this ends my discussions and that's all the coverage of my topic. Thank you for listening throughout my report and I hope you learned something on this presentation. Goodbye and God bless us all.